Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. If you look closely on a clear day, you see the buzzing of tiny computations happening just behind the scenes under the surfaces. They're in the laptops and they're in the PCs, they're in the smart surfaces that are surrounding us. They're in the television set, it's a Linux machine, it's an Android machine. They're in the smart glasses that the girl is wearing. They're outside in the cars and the GPSs and the buses that are managing the timetables as they move around the city, in the taxi cabs and the cycle, cyclists. The advertising panels are Android hand screen touch devices. Now the cars have embedded pads inside them which are Linux devices or Android devices. The computers are everywhere. And of course underneath the ground, these computers are controlling the electricity and the water pressure <coughs> and even carrying the data packets over the network to us through routers and switches. All of these devices need to be configured. And what you don't see is that if you listen very, very hard, all of these devices are crying, <laughs> because they need our help. They need to be configured. They need to be repaired. They don't just keep going by themselves. And they need to be updated and installed with the right software. And things are making them go wrong all of the time. And this is where configuration management comes in. How does this happen? There are many approaches we could try to make this happen. Here's a very traditional approach. This is a fantastic Heath Robinson drawing of how to scale up the goose step. Well, you take a goose, and you connect lots of strings to its feet, and you try to push this uh, command out to all of the subsequent clients that will receive this command. And this doesn't really scale that well. It looks kind of silly when you put it like this, and yet this is what the traditional approach to managing systems has been. We have a cultural bias in our society, which is that wouldn't it be great if I could just say, make it so, like Captain Picard does, and then suddenly great things would, cogs would turn, slaves would be whipped, uh, things would happen, and all of our wishes would be turned into reality. It doesn't quite happen like that. If somebody cuts this string, the instructions don't get there. If one of the guys detaches his string, it doesn't work. If one of the guys decides to go AWOL, because he just doesn't want to, it's very hard for somebody from outside to force him to do that. So if you try to manage something from without, if you try to force it from the outside, it doesn't work that well, it's very unreliable. What we would like to do to manage systems, to manage people, to manage anything, is to manage it from within. If the device, the person, intends to do that by itself, autonomously, then it's, you have a good chance that this will actually take place. So what does it look like in terms of configuration management for IT systems? How many of you have seen this before? You know what this is? Yep. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, this is not a letter from my mother. This is a small part of one of the many configuration files for the Apache web server. And if you run any kind of web service on the, on the net, in the cloud, whatever, you have to touch a file that looks something like this. You have to scan through this file, find the right lines, which I've carefully colored for you in red to make it easy. But you have to sift through all the junk, find the right lines, edit it by hand, uh, insert the right thing, reboot the system or, or restart the daemon, and then perhaps the system will start to behave in the way that you would like. This is the cold face of configuration management. This is the kind of thing that we have to do on a daily basis. And the imagine, to imagine doing this by hand on a single system is kind of tedious. But imagine a hundred systems, or a thousand systems, or ten thousand systems, like we have today. And it becomes simply unrealistic to do this without automation. So automation is going to play a key role in doing this. And the old way, of course, was to try to force this out by pushing things from the outside, by remote controlling commands from the outside, managing from without. But the new way, the modern way, which I'd like to ask you to think about a little bit today, 
and take home with you as a message from the conference is that the way to make this scale in data centers or in the cloud is to make this happen from within. So, wouldn't it be nice, imagine the possibility of being able to use our human intelligence not to force the world into compliance against the odds, but to create or design a model of the world that we, with our human thinking, intent, and expertise, could make uh, the system be in the intended state as we like it, without all of the cogs turning and the slaves being whipped and the screams. And it would be something that happened from within the system, self-building, self-maintaining an engine that would make this happen from, from within. And think something that didn't just configure things once, but it would actually nurse that state over time, like your immune system keeps you healthy over time. And it would happen from within. And this is the kind of innovation that we tried to bring about with CF Engine in the beginning of configuration management. And this picture kind of shows you an example of that thinking, something we all understand. These are the things that I would like to have, going back to that Apache example, the modules I must have and the modules I must not have. And we turn the whole thing into something that looks like an access control list, very simple, easy to understand. And then we feed this to a module. We feed this to the automation from within, and it takes this list and it ensures that that state is maintained, not just once, but dynamically over time as a continuous process. To see why this really came about, I want to tell you about a little bit of history uh, of configuration management um, to truly understand you know, what is the scope of the problem and why this came about. And you know, let's ask the question, what is configuration management? Well, love is the arrangement of parts into an aesthetic or functional pattern. This is what configuration means. And we want to do this to our IT system so that that picture that I showed you right at the beginning could be realized and be managed with all of its complexity without oversimplifying it and be turned into a desired state that functions according to the ways of commerce and human society. Well, we may have seen some of this before. Here is some configuration management from the 18th century. Beautiful garden. One of the things that uh, Britain and Japan share in common is a lot of gardens. And fantastically configured gardens, I might say. This garden has a, an aesthetic pattern, has some functions as well. People walk around it and enjoy it. You'll see it contains dynamical parts, static parts, but it has many parts. Some of them are trees, they're alive, they're changing by themselves from within. And so the best way to counter this uh, change to maintain a state, a desired state, is to manage it from within. If we don't do that, gradually the weeds will grow, the wind will blow the trees over, uh, the water will stop running, etc., etc. Probably some students will put a bottle of washing up liquid in the fountain so that it turns into a pile of foam, and this whole thing will disappear behind a cloud of bubbles. So the way we manage this, of course, is to have gardeners, little agents that run around the system from within and maintain the state by pulling the weeds by grooming the garden and keeping it in a nice looking state. Here's another pattern, another configuration of components that have been put together into a functional pattern. In this case, the idea is to put together these electrical components in such a way that the resulting thing is greater than the sum of its parts. It has a function which emerges from within as we put these things together. In this case, it's some kind of radio receiver, I think. And it also needs to be maintained. As the cosmic rays from the environment are coming in, destroying the memory registers in these chips, those things need to be error corrected. As the components fail gradually over time because they're being worn out, those components may have to be changed. The systems within the chips that do the error correction are completely invisible from us, and we take them entirely for granted today. But they are there during this channel error correction process. And we rely on that for the functioning of this device, for the functioning of the society on which this device uh, depends, and so on and so on. 
we cannot get away from the idea of putting things together and maintaining this state over time. It has to be continuously maintained and it has to come from within. So let's go back a little bit and look at how this history emerged. And I have made this drawing as best I can of the, somehow the history of configuration management, the evolution of this. And on the left-hand side, I've got the epochs of uh, human history, you know, the dinosaurs, uh, the Big Bang, the dinosaurs, the iPhone, the, the main events of human history. And 20 years of that time scale on the left-hand side in which configuration management emerged from 1990 to about today. And then on the bottom, I've got the evolution from the primitive pushing out of data or packages up to the current knowledge-oriented approach to thinking about configurations which will help us to deal with scale and complexity. And you see, the story began back in the early 90s with Ardist. How many of you remember Ardist? <laughs> I'm not the only old guy. All right, so Ardist basically blasted out sandblasted uh, systems with some kind of image. And if the system was down, they wouldn't get it. If the system got unplugged, they wouldn't get it. If the system just wasn't configured right, it wouldn't get it. So our disk was very much like the Heath Robinson contraption I showed you at the beginning. It didn't work that well. It worked because we had hundreds of machines instead of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of machines, as we do today. Then the next step was LCFG and CF Engine 1 which around 1993, both of the two independently. LCFG was the University of Edinburgh in France. Uh, CF Engine 1 was University of Oslo in France. Um, and then over the course of the 1990s, I developed CF Engine, and in 1998, came up with this idea of self-healing systems and computer immunology, I called it back then. And that gave this idea of convergence that a system could be brought back into a desired state by continuously maintaining the state from within. About the same time, this whole separate channel of uh, blade, uh, blade logic ops where satellite, the network shells, continued this push-based approach to management, but they didn't really scale that well. And they got rapidly out of control. They had to oversimplify the issues in order to cope with the kind of scale that they had. But as the world is becoming more complex, like in the first picture, all of this diversity of services and devices, that kind of oversimplification doesn't work. You can't blast out that same image to all of those devices and hope for a functioning, commercial, uh, trading, thriving world. You would kill it. 10 years after CF Engine 2, some of the other tools like Puppet and BCFG2 started to, to, uh, to, to, try to get in the game. And they moved slightly backwards towards away from this configuration management from within to going uh, to having a central server pushing out a little bit. And then sort of Chef turned back the other way again and, and, and got back in, <laughs> going back in the same direction. And what we did was to take off CF Engine and completely the direction towards separating the, the tasks between man and machine so that the machines from within did the work of the configuration and the humans from without designed the states and used their knowledge and their expertise and their human thinking, their intentions to program the desired states of those systems. So we separated the work into a part which where the machines worked for humans and the humans did the design. Rather than having humans work for machines being attached to pages and monitoring signals that sort of wake up humans in the middle of the night to repair something. So we don't want humans working for machines, we want the machines to work for humans and the way to do that is to give them the capabilities to repair their own state from within. We had some innovations in this area, the idea of convergence, that systems could converge to a desired state by themselves, and then this idea of promise theory, which took us five years or so to develop uh, a theoretical basis for how to get individual machines in a garden or in a data center to work together 
in such a way that they, they can promise to deliver certain things and then the whole sum of the parts will promise much more than the individual parts by themselves. And that is the model by which we imagine to deal with scale and complexity, not just scale, but scale with attendant complexity, the complexity we need to handle the diversity that the modern society craves. So what are the primary challenges that we face today? I think these are three. The primary colors of, uh, of, of IT are scale, the obsession with building new things because we have to support more and more stuff. And I'll explain why I'm saying uh, The complexity, we don't want to have to oversimplify our devices, our services to compete, uh, to cope. Because to compete with other companies, with other organizations, we need to have the advantage. So we need to have that edge on everybody else. And then, of course, as you scale things up, understanding the monster you've created gets harder and harder. Unless you oversimplify, then you need tools to be able to examine the system and understand how all of these parts fit together and why it was made this way in the beginning. Imagine losing your key sysadmin having set up the whole of the, your online services. The new person comes in and looks at it and goes, what on earth is going on here? And spends maybe a month just learning what's there. And then ends up reinventing the whole thing because you can't understand the old one. So unless you can maintain, manage your knowledge, your, uh, your knowledge of the system over time, you will have this constant <coughs> uncertainty and you won't feel confident, you won't trust your systems. So these are the three challenges of the next decade in my mind. The scale with attendant complexity <coughs> and obtaining certainty about the systems we create by instrumenting the system with the ability to look into the actual state and compare it to the desired state and then as the system is trying to bring it back look at the trends and the the influences of the environment and see how we can change and adjust our policies our intentions to create the best possible system over time, whether it's in the data center or in the cloud. Why all this, uh, all this complexity? Why can't we just simplify and make everything the same? Well, I call it the freedom equation, which is freedom is me, me, me. It's all about ourselves. We demand this complexity because of all these electronic devices that we like. Once we got the phones, the pads, the mobile devices, we suddenly had access to things, uh, to services, to information everywhere, and we demand more. And the more we demand, the more ideas people have, and the more we get seduced into doing even more stuff. And so it's a, a snowball that's rolling downhill, picking up momentum. If you look at the, the way the world changed, uh, it's pretty obvious that before the Second World War, we had these visions, you look at the movies at the time, it was visions of big society, putting together grand civilizations, galactic spanning empires. And then after the war, people were kind of fed up with those visions, and instead of ushering in the next chapter of the Roman Empire, the Italians bought scooters with their money after the war, and the Americans bought refrigerators and cars and, and bicycles and other things that enhanced personal freedom. People don't want to be a small brick in a large machine. They want to have the individuality, the freedom to explore and expand. And business, too, wants the freedom to explore and expand into areas that um, bring new ideas to the table. And the way that happens is by enabling the freedom to choose from within. If you try to force things from without, you're stuck with the old idea that is governed by a central commander, make it so. You want the ideas to come from within and enable people to compete with each other uh, and maintain their desired state in that kind of environment. And that means being personalized, untethered, mobile. And whether mobility means literally you know, mobile in your pocket, in your clothes, in your glasses, or simply 
a, fl a free floating resource out there in the cloud somewhere behind the walls, whether it's in Amazon's data center, Google's data center, or underneath this podium, it doesn't really matter. It's that flexibility that enables us to meet the challenges of tomorrow. So the freedom aspect is, is the reason why IT is exploding, the reason why the number of machines is growing, and why we need to have machine management of these, machine, of these things, autonomous management over time. What does it look like? Well, here's a stack, pretty familiar, I guess. We start with the firmware, and we have operating systems on top, and then middleware, usually way too many layers of middleware. Um, and then we have services that we connect to. And then on top of that, we have applications which deliver the value. And the business value is at the top of this chain. The, the things that people make their living from, that's in the applications. The services and the infrastructure underneath it just have to work. That's underneath the, the floor with the, the electricity and the sewage and, and the other devices. What you see is that as you go up the chain, these things are less and less mature. You know, firmware operating systems, these things have been around for some time. <coughs> Pardon me. They have some kind of maturity. They've been commoditized to a certain extent, mass. Uh, we've understood how to simplify them to the smallest possible extent, but they still need some customization. But as we go farther and farther up the stack, we need more and more individuality. That's where the individuality comes from. The ability to have freedom to compete and so on and so on. So our society really depends on this stack being well configured and being reliable and trustworthy. And that's where the configuration management comes in. There are two ways we can do that. The old fashioned way, I call it rocket science approach to system management. You get lots of experts, you set a date for a big rollout, and you plan and you build a rocket. You start stacking things on top of each other and put together this massive release. And on a certain date, you say, we're going to push the button and roll this out, blast off. And then hopefully everything goes well. And if it doesn't, your rocket's already blown up. You have to pick up the pieces and you start again. That's not a great way to do a business. Space flight didn't take off before aviation. What civil aviation did very smartly was to say, look, what we need if we're going to turn this into a business is a craft that can be made agile. It can be reprogrammed. It can be mass produced. It can be reprogrammed to travel to a new location, a new destination. We can pull out the seats and fill it with cargo, or we can put people in there. We can turn it around 20 times a day to different destinations and reuse this thing. We don't make a massive rollout, we make lots of small changes, lots of small rollouts. This is agility, this, is, this brings business continuity. You've probably heard of DevOps, which is the idea of continuous deployment in small steps using uh, a lot of the philosophy of uh, the Kanban and Kaizen processes. This is the kind of thing that enables systems to be agile and to compete and become uh, a regular resource that humans can use. And it happens because the management of these systems is not from without, from some mission control in Houston, but it comes from within. The pilots and the, the people that maintain the services inside, they make the decisions from within, and the system is managed from the inside out rather from the outside in. Here's another example of how to clean up a, a mess. They call this firefighting. I couldn't find a picture of a fire, but this is, the flood works just as well. So on the left-hand side, you have the old approach to system administration, where some flood happens. You wait for the flood to happen. You have a monitoring system. The, flood, the monitoring system wakes you up with your pager and says, hey, guys, there's a flood. Come and fix it. And so men come in with tools. And they start constructing systems and building things to, to suck up the water and clean up the system afterwards. And hopefully, afterwards, they look and say, why didn't we just design a drain into the infrastructure in the beginning? And then the system from within would have solved this problem before it even happened. It would be proactively repairing the system, maintaining the state, keeping the infrastructure ready to build 
applications or with houses on top of it and keep them safe and, and, and operational. So you begin to see why managing things from within makes a lot more sense. For a start, it scales better. You don't need 20,000 of these machines, these trucks with uh, hose pipes to suck up water and drive them around to the latest catastrophe. You just install these devices as part of the infrastructure to begin with, and then you're done. So the way to manage systems is to treat things as resources that belong to the system itself. They're not external to the system. They are part of the infrastructure. This is what CF Engine does. This is what the configuration and management does. It has an agent on every box, on the inside, working from the inside, with knowledge of the desired state. And that desired state has come from humans who are without, but, but that can be pulled in in a safe and, and trustworthy way. And then from within, the system adapts. Just like we have DNA inside us that governs our, our body processes, maintaining those in, internal processes that keep us going, keep us healthy, keep us adapting to new situations. The same thing with computers. And in configuration management, we divide the system therefore up into resources. And they're not you know, grass, flowers, gardens, trees, like in the pictures or capacitors, counters, resistors, or whatever. They are files, they're processes, they're commands, scheduled jobs. They are storage devices, they are uh, virtual machines. Different kinds of resources on which we depend. And each one of these things in CF Engine is managed as an independent resource, a self-healing, self-correcting, self-maintaining resource that can detect deviations from a desired state and repair themselves. And then it's hands-free. Human beings don't even have to get involved. Once they've said what is to be the desired state, that state will be maintained. Like the autopilot on the 747, if, the, if it drifts off course, we'll bring it back on course. And of course, the idea is not to take humans out of the loop, because Automation will always fail at some point. Something will go wrong. The, the autopilot will, will drop out because of bad weather. A dozen things can happen. The point is to have the automation there to, to give you the power to exert change to a diverse and varied system, while at the same time giving humans sufficient insight into what's going on that they can make those decisions well when the system fails. So they are in the loop continuously, but they're not wasting their time sucking up water with a hose pipe. They're looking down and saying, where do I need to put my next drains? How can I design the next wave of infrastructure? So it's about hands-free automation. And we don't really have time in a short talk like this to show you a lot of those details, but if you'd like to visit the CF Engine website, you'll see demos of how this happens, how CF Engine can fix you know, files, processes, in this case virtual machines, VMware, we have, uh, you know, can destroy a virtual machine and see if engine will bring it back again. So it brings them back up again. The disk is, is fixed as you go along, the disk condition is, is detected, that's repaired, and the machines come up afterwards. Happens hands-free. This is infrastructure that was not maintained. Sometimes when we build things and forget about them, if we just build them once and, and throw them over the wall, as my friend John Willis likes to say, um, if we forget about them, things that get neglected. There is a tendency for us to think that technologies like the cloud that make it very easy for us to build stuff remove the necessity to maintain them over time. That's not true. My favorite joke is how many sysadmins does it take to change a light bulb? And if we think of the way we normally build systems, it takes quite a lot, actually, because you would demolish the building and rebuild a new building with a working light bulb. That's the way we do stuff. We, we trash stuff and rebuild it. Just screw in a light bulb. How hard could it be? You need surgical precision, um, detailed uh, precision to be able to make systems efficient and keep them running. You don't need to tear down a building. You evacuate, mind you. 
and tear down a building and then rebuild it and get everyone to can resume their work. You don't need to take things offline. You can fix things in real time if you do it from within. And that is really the message. Um, perfect example of things going wrong, slums. Over the years, CF Engine's vision of uh, infrastructure engineering, this idea of, of managing from within, has been called, to me, science fiction, or even impossible to my face as many times as I can remember. Um, and it took you know, 10 years after the first CF Engine before other people started to get into the game and understand this. And they say that in industry, every new idea takes 10 years to, to be realized. I didn't believe this until it actually happened. But that certainly seems to be the case. For me, it's simple. Each time we exceed the impossible, we grow a little, we advance a little as a whole. And I think we owe it to ourselves to do that. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.